Good evening. The school board meeting of Tuesday, February 8th, 1994 is now called to order. The first item on the agenda is adjustments to agenda. Are there any adjustments? Okay, seeing none. Uh, the next item is approval of school board minutes of the meeting of January 18th, 1994. Are there any corrections? Okay, so minutes stand approved. The next item is comments by the high school representatives. I don't care here. Middle school representatives. Okay. Um, good evening. Um, on January 21st, the junior class sponsored a dance for the 7th and 8th grade students, and the money that they made went to the prom, went towards the prom. 7th and 8th graders recently had a Valentine's dance last Friday, February 4th, and made about $500 from that dance. Um, the second quarter has now ended, and the girls' basketball season has started, along with swimming and indoor track. That, will, that began this week. We are, we are also preparing for the um, upcoming interdisciplinary unit. The topic this year is the activities are based on um, is mean studies. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about the student council. We've been having fifth. We are having a fifth grade representative election soon, and we have been brainstorming on something to purchase for or contribute to the school. In the last years, we've been contributing stuff for like the computer room and like the art room, and we're not sure what we want to do yet this year. And this Wednesday, February 9th, we are going to have a spelling bee for the fifth, sixth, and eighth grade, seventh and eighth grade. Are there any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next item is communications. Are there any communications? Okay, I'd, I'd just like to take this opportunity to, um, to mention that I spent um, the day at the middle school today. Carla was there for part of the day also. Um, uh, school board members were invited in to talk to all the teams at the middle school, um, and, and they were nice enough to give up their planning time today in each of the, each of the team uh, meetings to, to sit and talk with us and let us know. Uh, what's on their mind, what issues are of concern to them, and it was, it was a great day. I think it was a really good experience, and I hope now we can do it at Palm Cove in the high school. I think it was fun. It just put a, a human face on that relationship between the, the school board and, and the teachers, which I think is often missing. So thank you, Nancy, for setting that up. It was a fun day. The next item is uh, the superintendent's report, and the first person on our agenda is our state senator, Jane Amaro, who's going to update us on some of the initiatives at the state level in education. Thank you, uh, Chair Chapman, Superintendent Goldman, members of the uh, K the School Board. Uh, I've been wanting to come and uh, share with you some of the really exciting things that I think are happening in Augusta. Uh, as far as education is concerned. And we'll get a chance to talk about school funding if you want to do that. But I want to talk about some policy changes in direction uh, that are occurring. And I I'm sure you're probably aware of some of the things that are happening, but uh, there was some legislation passed in the last session that I think is go going to be uh, uh, affecting our local schools here in Cape Elizabeth as well as all of the local schools across the state of Maine. And I'd like to start by saying that the legislation that was passed, which is public, now Public Law 290, which I think you have a copy of uh, in front of you, is a result of the work of uh, several task forces and groups in the state of Maine who over the past four years have been working on ways to try to pro uh, provide a vision for education in the state of Maine, trying to trying to develop a plan of action in which all of us uh, can be aiming toward the same goals. It all started back in 1989, 1990 with Maine's Common Core of Learning. And shortly after Maine's Common Core of Learning was published, 
a group got together called the Coalition for Excellence in Education. And this is the group that uh, Jim Orr, the CEO of Unum, chaired. And it was a group of close to 40 people across the state of Maine, business people, educators, representatives of leaders in our communities, who uh, spent about two years coming up with uh, a plan uh, which was actually based on the Common Core of Learning and uh, provided 14 or 15 uh, goals that this uh, coalition felt would help to lead Maine toward uh, uh, not only improving education but providing changes which would be based on results or uh, based on performance. And I guess this was the key of that report, is that uh, for many years we've been, uh, the state has set their standards based on inputs, and that is how many courses students have to have to graduate from our schools, how many years of English, how many years of math, et cetera, how many hours a day uh, children have to be in the classroom. Uh, and, and the report of the coalition, the one which I think you also have in front of you called Success Begins with Education, says that we need to put aside that emphasis on inputs, and we really need to look at results. And so the legislation, uh, which is now Public Law 290, uh, proposes to move the state of Maine toward results-based education. And it proposes to do that uh, with a two-part plan, the first of which will be coming out in one week. Uh, the, uh, this legislation established a task force uh, which began work uh, last June or July. And the task force first job was to come up with a vision for education in the state of Maine and to establish goals to head toward that vision. Their, their initial report on the vision and the goals uh, will be published next week. The second part of the task force responsibilities, which is really the hard work, is establishing the standards upon which those goals will be reached. And the establishment of standards will take another two years, so it will not be until early 1996 that we actually have the standards that we will expect all children in the state of Maine to reach. Now, the, the, this is a change, really, in policy for our state. Uh, because standards have always been set by the local school boards, uh, except for uh, pretty much inputs uh, that have been established at the state level. But now we're moving in a direction where we're saying we're going to have state standards, but we're going to free local school boards from mandates and provide them with flexibility and with technical assistance from the State Department of Education to help them in reaching those standards. So this is such a major shift in philosophy, I think, that it's very important that uh, local school boards be aware of that direction. Uh, the, the two years coming up in which the actual standards uh, will be developed is going to be a, a very intense time for a lot of people. The expectation is that many educators across the state of Maine will be involved in the establishment of those standards and that those standards will not be set in concrete, but they will have to be reviewed on a regular basis. And this is where the responsibility of the State Board of Education comes into play. The State Board of Education will be playing a larger role in the state of Maine in establishing policy. Um, so I'd like to just give you all a chance to react to that, if you would <laughs> like to, and maybe uh, try to pin me down on some specifics. But I, I, did, I, I felt that the legislation was really important for you to be aware of and to begin preparing for, as I know in, in uh, Cape Elizabeth that you're working on establishing your own standards, et cetera, and I think that that's great because whatever the state establishes, I would expect that Cape Elizabeth would want to do even more because that, that has been the tradition in this town and certainly that is a tradition that uh, I would applaud and I'm sure uh, that will be a something that we, we would want all school districts to consider. How can they improve upon the standards that the state will come up with, and how can they expand upon them? <laughs> Jane, thank you very much for that overview. I would be interested in knowing what mandates are going to be, uh, are we going to be relieved of? Uh, do you have any ideas at this time? 
the expect if if the uh, recommendations of the coalition uh, uh, for excellence in education, the recommendations that are found in that uh, report called "Success Begins with Education," if those recommendations are the ones that are implemented, uh, school districts would be freed up pretty much to manage their schools the way they want to. And that would go as far as, uh, that would include certification. That would include the number of days uh, a year that you go to school. It would include the hours in the day that your children go to school. It would include, you know, uh, establishing your own calendar. If you wanted to go to a year-round calendar, that would be fine. Whatever seems to work for a local school district uh, would be, uh, uh, would be possible as long as you could assure that your graduates, by the time they reached uh, 12th grade, were able to, or whatever, it might take 13 or 14 years, maybe 15, uh, that at some point they would be able to uh, master uh, the, the standards that had been set, set by the state. So I see it as a combination of state standards and local flexibility to get to those standards. How, how would you anticipate the state would monitor different districts achieving those results? I would expect that there would be benchmarks along the way. For example, now we have the fourth grade, eighth grade, and eleventh grade MEA uh, assessment uh, tests that there would be something similar to that because you wouldn't want to wait till 11th or 12th grade and say sorry uh, to students. Uh, you would want to make sure that along the way uh, students were being prepared to reach those final results. Yeah, and a follow-up question on that. As, as you pointed out, Cape Elizabeth has oftentimes tried to exceed certain state requirements. Yes. Um, there may be school districts that are going to have a very difficult time meeting if it's a median type of results-based concept, there's going to be some school districts that are very much going to struggle compared with school districts that may already um, exceed those expectations. How would the state address those two questions with the, the differentials in socioeconomic status and those concerns? Yeah, I would expect that the standards would be such that some students might reach those standards in ninth or tenth grade. Some other students might not reach them until several years of what we would now call postgraduate work. Uh, some students might be going to school throughout many of the summer weeks uh, in order to meet the standards. I, I would say the school districts would have to uh, find what works for the type of population that they have in their district uh, to help those individual students achieve the standards. But it really does put the onus on the school districts to perform and on the students to perform as well. Yes, Connie. Jane, the um, uh, various avenues for determining reaching standards, uh, the whole trend of either outcomes-based or even looking at the end product in one way or the other, um, what use of alternative assessment and some of the difficulties that, that arise with alternative assessment to get some kind of uniformity that or consistency perhaps at a statewide level? I mean, are you working with the relearning projects or? Or is there some consortium going on, the Vermont experience in portfolio assessment and so on and so forth? There, there is a task force of 20 people who are working on how to get to establishing those standards. And part of that process will be how to measure achievement of those standards. And the direction that has been given to the task force is that we do need to find alternative ways of assessing uh, performance. Uh, so I am sure that in their deliberations over the next two years, they will be calling on uh, expertise from all the different states that have already begun this process, uh, uh, and particularly states that have looked at some alternatives for assessments such as Vermont. And also, um, I'm reading and hearing from other people, uh, there is some national trend um, actually objecting to the use yes. of the term of outcomes based. Is that surfaced at the state level in any way? Well, uh, our first defense against uh, uh, that opposition is that we're calling our approach 
uh, results-based, mm -hmm. trying to get away from the onus of uh, some of the states that have used uh, outcomes-based education. Because I, I, uh, I think that if we really have a thorough understanding of what we mean by results-based education, which for me is education based on what a child is able to do and can demonstrate that, that, that they are able to do, that very few people would be opposed to it if you are specific enough and if, you're, if your standards are not so gray uh, that it's hard to uh, uh, establish whether anybody has ever achieved them. I think that that has been one of the uh, uh, reasons why people have been opposed to uh, education based on performance is that uh, some states have not been able to be specific enough in the standards that they were trying to develop. And some have gotten into the, the whole discussion of uh, values. Uh, and th that's been a difficult one, too. We are expecting that there will be opposition, for sure, particularly as, as, uh, as we get closer to the enactment of those standards. Uh, and certainly, we are preparing uh, uh, to uh, uh, for that for that type of reaction, and and I think we'll be ready for it. Do you see some of that resistance coming from boards, school boards? Um, they, they would be giving up some power. I I don't I don't really envision that. Although there may be some, but I don't think really that school boards would be given up as much power as they would be empowered. Uh, to provide uh, more of a local approach to what they're doing, rather than uh, marching to standards uh, that the state had set that were based on uh, um, certification of teachers, based on types of courses that you have to offer, based on the number of credits that you have to have in the different categories, et cetera. So I think that what we have right now is far more limiting to school boards than what I envision coming out of uh, th this approach. But certainly they'll be questioning because it is, it is quite a change. And I think on the, uh, there will be people at the state level who will not want to give up some of the, some of the uh, controls that they have right now either. One last question. Has there been any discussion about how the state standards will uh, interface with national standards, especially, for instance, national standards that are out in mathematics? Literature is actually more difficult. But. Right, and uh, there has already been a, a lot of work done in mathematics uh, on uh, uh, by the Mathematics Association. I don't remember what their formal name is uh, in, in establishing standards. And certainly, we don't want to reinvent the wheel here in the state. Uh, but there is also, because of the National uh, Science Foundation money that is in the state of Maine, a lot of work already being done here in the state as well. Uh, on establishing math standards. So I would hope that there would be good coordination be between what's happening at the national level and what's happening at the state level. Yes, I would just say that it, certainly if this process works well, um, it, it would do a lot in, in terms of doing groundwork for communities. Certainly I would think that, as you said, Cape Elizabeth could expect to exceed the standards by right. right. some measure know that better when we see them, but I was wondering what the process will be for getting feedback on the standards as they're developed. I don't think that that process been, has been laid out yet, but uh, the task force itself will be doing that over the next few months, and that'll, that will be a very important piece of their work because uh, I, I think it's really important that they involve the public. Uh, right from the very beginning, so that this doesn't come as a surprise to people in two years, and that, and so that there is a lot of input uh, and a lot of discussion uh, that prepares people for really this change of, of course. And, and uh, to follow up on what you, your comment, Anne, about uh, you know setting the groundwork and establishing a, a state goal or state vision. Uh, the director of the Coalition of Excellence in Education, a couple of months ago, went out and uh, established, uh, well, visited with 
many communities throughout the state and had these focus groups in which she met with a group of teachers or with a group of superintendents or a group of school board members, uh, a group of students, et cetera, in uh, various communities across the state of Maine. And one, uh, one of the uh, criticisms that she heard from all of these groups uh, was that there was not enough state leadership in education, that, that, that everybody was trying to make changes within their school district, they're all trying to restructure, they're trying to do new things, but nobody had an overall direction of where is it that we're all going? And can we afford in this age of uh, a global society for every community to, to be going it alone when our kids are gonna be moving not only all over the state, all over the country, or all over the world. We've got to be a little bit more uh, together on what it is that we're, we're trying to do. So I, I think this will help bring together a lot, of, uh, a lot of the great things that are happening across the state of Maine in restructuring. Bring them together so that uh, some school districts that haven't yet even begun the, uh, to restructure their schools uh, uh, will have some direction. One other, in, sort of along those lines, Jane, um, to what degree is the university system involved in this? And the reason I ask that, not only from the standpoint of a kind of systemic state effort in education, obviously, um, but also um, much of what passes for curriculum development is far more dictated by colleges than people realize. Not only is it the acceptance into college, but the um, the difficulties that high schools will have if they're going to outcomes-based education. How are they going to assure parents that there will be a packet put together that will in fact make sense to whatever college the family may be looking at or technical school or employer for that matter. So what do you see as a role of the university system, possibly other private universities in the state and so on as a part of this effort? I see the university system, the technical colleges, the private colleges, uh, all helping to establish those standards because after all, they are the people that say, we are not getting students who are well enough prepared uh, for the courses we have to offer and we are having to offer at high, higher education all kinds of remedial courses. This is their opportunity to say what it is, what, what are the skills that they need, that kids need to have to, to, to be successful uh, in a university setting or in a technical college setting. Uh, in a private college setting. Uh, so we're, I think there's a major role for the universities uh, and higher ed to play, and they are involved in the task force. I also think there's a major role for the business community to play as well, because the business community has also been saying the same thing that uh, our college people have been saying, is that they are not getting students who have the skills to, uh, uh, to do the work that needs to be done in the kind of jobs that are available today. So I see business also playing a role in helping uh, to establish those standards. Great, thank you. Uh, I'd like to just switch hats for a minute. Can I well, not this? hats, but gears. Can I just make one plea? Sure. And that is, as this process is going forward, I think it's important to, as, as much as possible, to minimize the amount of paperwork and the bureaucratic processes that tend to go with, with these kinds of things. If that, People could just keep that in mind all along the way. The paper trail, as you know, is just immense for every step that you do these days. And to the extent we could you know, clean up that process. And what's even more amazing to me is local school districts are, are required to provide all this information to both the federal level and the state level. And yet at the state level, we don't have data about what's going on in our schools so that we can put all of that information together and make good state policy based on it. Yeah. It's really uh, very discouraging. <laughs> but I hear what you're saying, and it's an important, very important. On the, on the issue of school funding, which I know is the bottom line for all of us, is how much money are we going to get this year? Uh, the Education Committee of the Legislature is really just beginning the debate on school funding. So we're in the very early stages. Uh, as you know, there was a compromise made last year to go back to the school funding formula in two steps. Uh, last year was step one, this year is scheduled to be step two. 
there was a lot of resistance to actually implementing the second year of that compromise. Not, not a surprise, I guess, to a lot of people. Uh, last year, we were able to come up with four million extra dollars in general purchase aid to cushion some of the communities that were going to experience dramatic losses in school funding. There is no, that money is not there this year to provide any further cushion. Uh, the governor says that if in the next couple of weeks the revenues look uh, better than what were projected, his first priority is to put more money into general purpose aid. So if that happens, I would say the chances are good for providing another cushion for some communities, and there are communities in the state who would be drastically affected. Uh, by the second year of this compromise. Uh, if, if we're able to come up with that extra money, the chances um, um, are improved for the uh, second year impl implementation occurring. And I think that, it, as Connie, I'm sure, has told you, uh, that would be very good for Cape Elizabeth. We will be receiving uh, more money than we did last year. and. Uh, there are not a lot of communities in the state where that's happening. Um, uh, unfortunately, most of the communities that would be receiving additional funds are located in this part of the state, so we still have that north versus south battle to fight. In the meantime, there are three or four proposals for, cha for changing the school funding formula, which the uh, uh, Education Committee is uh, discussing. and. Uh, Right now, the uh, proposal which has the most uh, support is, is the uh, school funding task force proposal to uh, target the state's money toward essential programs and essential services. And we're in the midst right now of uh, putting together figures and seeing what that's going to mean for school districts. Uh, so the results aren't in on uh, that whole proposal yet, but there's a lot of interest in moving in that direction on the part of both the legislature and the governor. Scott, Scott did you have a question? Yeah, I did, if you, if you don't mind. Um, in terms of the subsidy that's been established right now for the school departments, do you see that changing over the course of the next, the next year, or do you see that funding formula staying the same uh, until things are settled at the state level? You're talking about the subsidy for fiscal year 95? Fiscal year 94, 95. Well, the, the, for fiscal year 94, that's set. It that, is. that won't change. Uh, I think everybody has gotten their money for fiscal year 94, haven't yes. you? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, at least what we're supposed to have gotten by yeah. now. Right, I mean, <laughs> right. <laughs> so I don't say fiscal year 95. Okay, fiscal year 95 uh, is what I was really basically just talking about. Uh, there are several scenarios that could take place. Uh, it could, it could uh, uh, happen that the printout that you've got uh, would be what would be enacted. Uh, if that printout is going to be enacted, it's going to require more money to cushion the communities uh, upstate that are, that are uh, going to experience major losses. Uh, there could be a whole change in, in the school funding formula, which would be different from basing the uh, distribution of funds on two-year-old actual expenditures at the local level to targeting student-teacher ratios uh, per pupil expenditures for uh, maintenance, uh, for administration, et cetera. That, that's the proposal we're looking at right now. That could go into effect for fiscal year 95, possibly. Do, do you see any possibility that these, uh, that the um, state standards issue might sometime be tied to funding for schools um, in terms of you know, either schools meeting those um, criteria or extra help going to schools who aren't meeting the criteria for some reason? Do you foresee that having any um, Interface that. That's, that is the Kentucky model. I would say that there would be a lot of interest in uh, targeting funds to school districts that are not able to meet the standards. There would also be interested in pro providing some sort of state technical assistance to help those districts. Uh, but the question arises if after three or four years of help and extra help, those schools are still not meeting the standards, then what happens? 
and I, uh, you know, that will be for future uh, <laughs> legislators to decide. Well, Very, very much. Thank you, and I will keep you posted as the school funding maze unravels and, uh, and let you know how things are going, and maybe ask you to come up and uh, do some testifying. Oh, please, please, if there's anything we can do, let us know. Right, we'll Thank be you. delighted. Thank, Thank you very much. See you. Okay, Connie. And in addition to thanking Jane, I also want to take the moment to add <coughs> To the report, um, a note of congratulations. Uh, we have a couple of seniors who are senior athletes who, um, it's really kind of a neat distinction. Two of them coming, uh, Kelly Wood and Sean Brady, been named to the All-American High School soccer teams. And I know in some of the commentary I've heard that for a small town like Cape Elizabeth to have two youngsters come out um, for national recognition in soccer certainly says something. Mainly it says, Congratulations to those two young people. Thank you for representing us so well. Um, okay, zipping on down. What is that, a commercial? It's a zippy kind of thing. Oh, sorry, you know, I read something about commercials today. They've been running through my mind. Our next item is the follow-up on computer classes. Um, and Nancy Hutton, I'm not sure if every, has everybody received yes. the report, Nancy? Yes, yes, they have. Yes, I delivered them. Oh, and delivered those for us. So they're there. Um, I haven't actually had a chance to read everything in there, but I got started this afternoon shortly after I received it, and I was fascinated. It's actually some stuff I'm going to take and sit, you know, in front of the computer and uh, try out. So I, I congratulate you and the group, particularly, I guess it was Andrew. Well, I, I think particularly we need to congratulate the group, and for the report, we need to thank Andrew Lomet McNair who was unable to be here tonight to do this. So I came first to hand the report out to you, but we took care of that in another manner. So one of my jobs has already been taken care of. And then also to just really quickly let you know about the, the overlay of this particular report. But I think you will find it, um, hopefully you will find it pleasing to read because I think it addresses an issue that came up in our budget process last year about training teachers to uh, use computers, providing in-service for that. And a group of teachers got together this summer and planned a course. And this is about the first semester delivery. They've actually um, worked with 32 teachers, 33 teachers actually so far. And they are planning to start the third cycle of the course uh, soon. And But instead of doing two cycles at a time this time, I think their plan is to have one during the school year and then another one immediately after school gets out. That's one of the things that they found as instructors that doing two concurrent sessions was very demanding on their time and they felt that this would be a better pacing and also a number of teachers indicated that the summer course would really meet their needs much better. But as you look at what Andrew has done for you, I think he's very clearly set up how they came about and decided to do the course, their time frame, and their focus. And all throughout their course presentations, it really was, how would you use this in your professional life? And as the presentations were made, to think about ways that you could apply it to your classroom and to what you need to do in being a, a teacher, sharing things with the students or even to help the management of your own paperwork system. And I think when you look at what he's included, here is the overview, the syllabus of the entire course a couple of examples of two of the classes that they did. He offered to provide the syllabuses of each class, but I felt that if you had just a couple of examples, you'd have a flavor of the kind of things that went on. And also their final product uh, that all the students had to complete. And their first criteria is it must be useful to you in your professional life, which really does get at that question that came from the board last year, too, about having people be computer literate, but also using the computer as an instructional tool. And they really made that an absolutely critical part of their program. As you can see, if you have a chance to glance through it, they really looked at word processing, they looked at databases, spreadsheets, those kinds of things that could really help with the students and also help make their classroom life go easy, more easily. They did talk a little bit about the parts of the computer and to do the things, but not with the intent of 
producing a lot of mini computer repairmen or repair women, but uh, really more to just help people if they got into a glitch themselves that they could get themselves out of it. The pink sheet that's in there is the final evaluation, course evaluation sheet that people put in there. And I think a compliment to the group when they devised it, they're always asking them to think, I will use the skills I learned in this section for each one of their sections that they went through. Andrew came over and met with me and I had a chance to glance through these and people have really checked that off. I think we have a group of at least 33 teachers who are extremely excited about using computers, feel they are ready to use them in their classroom. They understand the constraints of the budget, but they're also afraid if they wait too long then they may lose some of those skills. So they want to have access at least to some machinery to apply those skills on. And I know when Anne was in the middle school today, which Anne, by the way, I would like to thank you very much for coming and giving us an opportunity too to spend some time with you. And Carla, thank you for the time that you were able to spend with us. And we say that realizing everyone else has very busy schedules and not everyone can come during the day. Um, but I know Anne did hear over and over that people are really concerned about computers. I think we heard that at every single meeting. And a number of these people were at these courses. This is a course, by the way, that really um, was aimed at K through eight teachers. And the way we funded it is the middle school and the elementary school put their staff development budgets that they had dedicated to computers together and came up with a package that they felt would impact and be benefit to those particular teachers. The high school was not left out for any particular reason. Um, it was when the computer committee met last spring and they looked for the subcommittee of who would work on this course. It was elementary and middle school teachers who were interested in designing the course and delivering it. And so that's really who the course was designed for at that particular time. And the, really the credit for the report does go to Andrew, but a credit to all four members of that committee, Ren Wilkinson, Andrew Lomack McNear, Randy Perkins, and Marty Watts. They all worked together to design and to deliver the course. And if you have any on technical questions, not components of the computer, I'll be glad to answer them. I'm just pleased with the response, and, and I've heard at your administrative council that they need the, hard, the hardware to work with, and that's, that'll be forthcoming. That'll be forthcoming. I, you, you will hear that many times during the budget process as well. Hopefully, we, you know, over the next two years, by the time we open our renovated new facilities, but all those will be in place. I, I did hear today at every single um, team meeting the need for the computers and that, you know, that dilemma of now they know, you know, what to do with them, but they don't have them to work with them. And, and we are, we're in an awkward position right now. Clearly the teachers have demonstrated what we asked them to demonstrate, and that is a real, um, you know, willingness to learn the computers and to want to apply them. And while we are in an awkward position, I did try to stress that this is also a time of opportunity for us to really develop a curriculum that is inclusive of computers, um, you know, while we're waiting for the new building. So, right now, just make it through the next two years. I think it's going to be great. And we'll work on that. And I would say, too, just in closing, that when the opportunity comes out for these courses, uh, we don't have to twist any arms to get people to go to the courses. The teachers were really very interested um, in doing this type of in-service work and really did see the application for their classroom life and what, how they would use it with students. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's nice to see things that start in one budget process go through and come back and uh, actually the next item, and, and this isn't a report, it's just to make sure, just to comment, uh, make a public comment and also answer any questions. Another issue that we've been working on for at least the last two years, um, looking at it more at the building levels, uh, the whole systemic issue of reading. Uh, this past year there's been um, an effort at the high school to analyze some of the struggles that even high school students have with reading comprehension um, and how that affects their ability to succeed and so on. Obviously Actually, finance subcommittee member there, um, Ann and Beth joined us, and, and Carla joined us, and then um, before Mark came, came to our meeting, 
downstairs, found no one here, and came upstairs. So. Um, we did sign the warrants. Uh, we did a review of the main State Retirement Audit. Uh, we looked at the December school lunch income statement. Um, and we also, Scott handed out the first draft of our proposed 94-95 budget for board to, to look at. Um, and dealt with a um, teacher initi initiated trip which had brought up some problems. And essentially that was our, our meeting. Okay, any questions? I just do want to apologize for not being present, but I did have a commitment I could not get out of. Right. Uh, the next is the policy subcommittee. Rosemary, I don't know that you have anything to report since your meeting's tomorrow. <laughs> That's what I would have reported. The meeting is tomorrow and the agenda is full. <laughs> yes, I would think it is. Okay. And the next is the school building committee. <laughs> well, we, we certainly are moving. Um, every meeting you now, there are all kinds of uh, decisions, some of them sort of decisions in transit, not necessarily final decisions. At this point, we are definitely uh, getting into specific planning for phasing. Um, that is, where do we actually put classes next year? Um, we know we're going to be using some portable structures. We've already looked at assuring uh, teachers and children, parents, that they will be safe structures. We are aware that there used to be some concerns about air quality control, and we understand that they now have air exchangers in them. We will be uh, asking people that we're working with, our consultants, to make sure that those are acceptable. I want to make sure that people get these pieces of information. Uh, I know that, that is a question we're likely to be asked. Um, Charlie and I met today with the um, Architects and um, the gentleman that will be our, who will be our um, clerk of the works, who comes very highly recommended. He really is impressive in his background and the kinds of projects he's worked on. It's obvious why, you know, talking with him, that he is a uh, high quality person. Um, and I can't emphasize enough how important that is to have that kind of help. So we're really getting into a lot of nutsy boltsy things now, and. Um, We'll be going to the planning board in March. Um, the DEP process has been started. The zoning board process is, uh, I hope, three quarters of the way through. Um, those kinds of things are, are moving along. And um, we, we will be inventorying furniture. We're talking about a process for doing that. We know we're not going to be buying all the furnishings, so in case anybody is wondering about that. Um, talking a little bit to staff and give you updates as we get them. And I think the architects feel that we are very much on schedule. We, we haven't fallen behind yet. Yeah. And, and the budget is falling into place, too, I yeah. should also mention. We've made some hard decisions um, about what the building's going to look like and, and made some choices, but I think they've been very responsible and protect the program and protect the integrity of the building for next generation. Any questions? I, th I think the most interesting aspect is about to, to take place, and that's the selection of colors. <laughs> <laughs> to, to a great degree, this committee has been very cohesive in, in their uh, decisions. And uh, we started to see a little bit of it at our last meeting, that uh, uh, when you're getting down to choices, the, the people's personal, personal desires sometimes come to the forefront of uh, what's best for the project. But it's been a very cohesive group and a very um, uh, educational experience, too. I just hope we don't have to spend as much time talking about color as we have been talking about parking. <laughs> <laughs> there will be plenty of parking, plenty. both at the middle school, right. elementary, and high school. So to, to uh, allay any fears of taking the student population, that's being looked at very seriously. Okay. Okay. Um, the next item is calendar committee, which is a very short committee, short term commitment uh, we put together every year just to to look at our calendar for the forthcoming year. So it's 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 time to do that, and I and I believe that uh, Carla has indicated she'd be willing to serve on that. It's really a matter of. 
know, prob probably two meetings. Um, last year we had the administrators, some teachers, and um, you know, I think it's a productive process to do it that way. So we'll take care of it. Go ahead, set that up, and report back maybe with a draft calendar in March. Is that possible? Um, Too early. April's probably a little okay. more realistic. Okay, the next item is unfinished business, and the first item is discussion of phase-in of building projects. I alluded to that under the um, building committee. I just want to make sure that both the staff and um, the public at large are aware that we are looking at the high school to put a few elementary classrooms. Um, the thinking on that is that we seem to have a smaller kindergarten coming in. Uh, we don't yet know the numbers, but it would urge people to try to um, make sure that if you're sending a child to kindergarten this year that they do call the Pond Cove office and make sure that we have that count. Uh, but it looks like it's going to be considerably smaller than the current kindergarten. Uh, we have a room that we now use as a sort of gym room which we could convert into a classroom. Um, and we are looking at other rooms on that first floor um, that may be um, available to us. Uh, that would offer an opportunity to cluster some elementary teachers and, and uh, to deal with things like lunches and buses and playground and so on in an area that's already pretty well worked out for those kinds of things. We certainly will keep the public informed as we begin to make hard decisions on this and uh, look for availability. Uh, what we really think is going to happen is that between those rooms at the high school, uh, probably a couple of rooms for Pond Cove at Middle School, and the four portables, we will be able to put all of the second and third grades into um, some other place. This opens up the, um, uh, the project, frankly, so that uh, they can actually move faster than they thought because the original phase in was for building the bridge and then doing part of the Lunt building. This will enable us to empty out the Lunt building so they can do all of that renovation at that point. Um, moving faster because the more we can leave chunks of the building empty, uh, the faster the work will go. Um, obviously, there'd be some moving around uh, after that. And um, an important issue we're going to have to pin down pretty quickly is where are we going to put the portables? Um, we had some conversation today about traffic patterns and construction patterns and, and safety issues and so on. And um, we'll be giving you an update on that. Uh, will people know at the end of this year where the, all their children will be in classes next year, or is there a possibility that we won't know? I would anticipate that we can be quite definite on that by June, and maybe by May, or I wouldn't think too much before that, but we already have a tentative schedule. I mean, we've been looking at and figuring out how many rooms we need, given the number of divisions we have for next year. So that's... Um, we have had some conversation with the portable rental units. Uh, we're asking the clerk of the works to help us in determining exactly where to put them. I mean, there's a whole bunch of technical issues that we have to get into. Uh, I certainly think we can have all of that to people before the end of this school year. I, I think one of the qualities that came out of this interview was the, the safety, the, the the attitude of safety in this particular superintendent of, of, of the project, if, if he is hired, it's, it's an utmost on his, on his list. Even though it's a, not a part of his job, it's, it's utmost on his priority list. And uh, I think he'll work very closely with, with the school in maintaining. The problem is this is going to be a very highly visible project. We haven't had anything of this magnitude in this town for many, many years, and it's how, how do you how do you protect them and safeguard you know when when the construction crews aren't there and that kind of thing. So he's aware that this is going to be a very highly visible project, not just from the standpoint of staff and, and students, but from the community at large. So, and being as close to election, I mean, for passage of this referendum, it's going to stimulate even more. Interest. I just want to also point out that uh, I know that uh, Beth and Nancy have been talking to the staff at Pond Cove and that there's been a kind of nice spirit of 
of, of um, a sense of pioneer spirit, I guess is the word for it. Uh, we all know that there's a year for the Pine Cove and then the following year, a year for middle school, when um, the, it will be a juggling act to make sure that things are going well educationally. People who will have the least trouble with it will be the students. Uh, they will do just fine, and uh, I think as soon as the staff gets into the group, they'll do just fine too. And we'll certainly try to invite parents so that they can see and allay some of their concerns. And we're trying to think of as many of the predictable questions and concerns that people have. Like I mentioned, uh, the portable air control, we know that that has been raised as an issue, and we want to make sure that we, I can tell you, we will check that, and we will not put anybody in an area that's unsafe probably be better air control than some of the places we're using right now. Absolutely. <laughs> Any other comments, questions? Okay, moving on. Uh, the next item is second reading of the policy on volunteers. And as I said in the packet, and it basically as I understood it, the major issues that um, People had some problems with, with the repetitive use of the word paid. We simply took it out because, after all, staff does imply, uh, if not actually say, that that is a, an appointed position. So if you're satisfied with that, then it was fine with us, too. Uh, Madam Chair, I move we accept uh, policy file IICC volunteers as amended to delete the word paid. Okay, the next item is consideration of recommendation from the principal search committee, and I just know that that's our, Peter was our chair of that committee as well. Well, I don't mind speaking. I didn't <laughs> think you did. <laughs> I want to thank the members of, of the Principal Search Committee, Peter Leslie, Mark Forey, Gail Adzett, Betsy Wiley, Sam Boothby, Ann Kerner. And last year we did have a student representative. Um, I think that this group uh, spent a lot of time last year um, trying to set up criteria, trying to decide uh, how we would go about the interview process, talking to a lot of people, doing a lot of, of referencing and so on. And uh, we all felt, as a result of that process, we had a pretty clear sense of what it was that we were looking for for the building. Um, when we realized that we were, we were looking for an interim principal and turned to our assistant principal, um, Rick DeFusco, it was with a sense that he knew well what that committee had identified as the criteria for the principal. And we frankly thought he, he met those criteria, but we did agree that this would be an interim year. And as a kind of follow-up procedure, we did in fact um, post in-house and attracted a candidate in Randy Ray as the assistant principal. Uh, when the committee got together and, and talked this year over, compared notes, the teachers in fact had talked with the faculty, uh, our parent representative had talked with other parents, I also, of course, with the board, we had had that experience too. Um, and frankly, it, it didn't take us very long to come out with a unanimous recommendation from that committee to this school board that um, I nominate Rick DeFusco to be our principal of Elizabeth High School and to nominate Randy Ray to be our assistant principal of Cape Elizabeth High School on a regular basis. And we can scratch the interim. It was with a great deal of pleasure that we came to that decision. It was, I've been in a position to make a lot of personnel decisions and some of them are frankly not that easy to make because you have a little reservation here and there, but this was a relatively easy decision. Can we move, remove interim from channel three effective tomorrow? We certainly can try. We'll try. I'm <laughs> not sure uh, whoever is responsible for doing that. How about your letterhead? What is your letterhead? There's nothing on it. <laughs> they have in-house service, though. It's pretty fast. Mm. <laughs> Any comments, Charlie? I would only, I only have one um, reservation, not about accepting your nomination, but I would as far as the contract and this year, 
because the contract states that there is an interim position for this fiscal year. So it, I would recommend it to be for the fiscal year 94, 95. That would be my understanding because the contract has been signed. The, there are two reasons for bringing it as a year-long contract. There are two reasons for bringing it at this point. Uh, as you can see later in the agenda, uh, the whole administrative slate is on here because that is the way the statute now reads, that there should be, uh, it is now becoming regular business of the February. Uh, however, it's always understood that that is an appointment for the following calendar, or excuse me, school year. In our case, it's a fiscal year, July, it starts in July. That is your understanding. I don't know what we had necessarily talked about. Yes, I will see. Okay, what? I'd like to make a motion. Okay, would you like to deal with these? Why don't we do this one? Separately. I move that we accept the superintendent's nomination uh, for, Mr. for Mr. Rick Fusco and Mr. Randy Ray as principal and vice principal of Cape Elizabeth High School. I second that. Any discussion? I would just like to add my uh, input, and that is last year I remember being very much impressed as we did our interviews of the high school principals with the caliber of the staff here at Cape Elizabeth. And at the time that we elected to uh, have an interim principal and vice principal, we all felt very comfortable with the quality of the staff that were fulfilling those positions. Uh, it has been a, really a tremendous joy to watch the success that, that uh, Rick and Randy have had this year, and we very much look forward to uh, the upcoming years with you leading the high school. I certainly agree with what Mark just said. I think many of us at the last board meeting um, expressed our, our pleasure in working with you. It's, it's been a real pleasure, and I know it's been a pleasure for the children, the students, and the uh, parents. <laughs> I shouldn't call them. No, no you're good. <laughs> You'll get phone calls tomorrow. Oh, probably. <laughs> I, I would also um, add my um, con con uh, recommendation to that also. And I think what has happened this year is that Rick has had to had to deal publicly as the principal with some very difficult issues. I think as a system for the past, he's been dealing with these. And, and because he was not the front person, had, did not really have to take a lot of heat. And I think he's handled that very well. And I commend him for that. Well, I might as well add my kudos to the uh, administrative team, and I hope ditto is in flip. But. <laughs> All in favor? Six there. Congratulations. Congratulations. I'm very relieved because I was always afraid at the last minute you might, you know, something might happen to the head. You <laughs> change your mind. <laughs> Well, we're looking forward to what's ahead. The, um, next, the next item is new business, nomination of administrators for a 1994-95 school year. And as I explained, uh, in case anybody in the public is watching this, there is a change in the state statute. We used to nominate our principals closer to the end of the school year, but it is now um, the policy to do this in February again, as I just said, really for the upcoming year. <coughs> And, where's my sheets? Yeah, here we are. Uh, since we've already taken care of the first two, I'll start with the rest of the slate. Nancy Hutton, middle school principal. Bill Jewett, middle school assistant principal. Beth Anderson, Pond Cove principal. Nancy St. John, Pond Cove assistant principal. Keith Weatherby, athletic director. I should note that is a half-time position. He is half-time teacher. And Wayne Dorr, director of special education. Uh, those are our building administrators, and we also uh, have a practice of um, uh, appointing the community services director and assistant director, Sue Weatherby and Janet Hoskin. I move that we accept the superintendent's nomination for administrators for the 94-95 school year. Rosemary, any discussion? All in favor? And as I noted in my, uh, my notes to you, 
This is a hardworking crew. Uh, they deserve, I think, a lot of credit, and I just want to publicly go on record. I've never seen a harder working group. Uh, it's incredible to me. Some days it's hard to think of a cheerful thing to say, and we still manage to smile. Um, there is a lot of under, you know, things that don't come to the surface that administrators have to deal with day in and day out. A lot of it is less than glamorous. And the fact that people keep, you know, at it with courage and good humor and always, always caring for kids uh, is impressive to me. And I really personally think, because I work with them a lot, and I know how good they are. It's been really uh, a hard two years ago. And <laughs> it is not just the, the elementary and middle school administrators and staff. It's also, also going to impact the high school because there will be students moving, classes moving into those, uh, into that facility also. So it's going to be a, a team effort. And, and I see that as we've gone through the concept stage and now into actual phase development, that it's been a cohesive group of folks. And that's very positive. It's going to serve as well. Well, we've already had a little conversation at the high school on that and, and uh, discovered that there's going to be, it's a systemic approach, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, I, I would just like to say thank you too as board chair for making my job easier and always being willing to talk to me about whatever is on my mind and what's on the mind of board members and being so willing to listen to gripes and give us explanations for things that probably seem like they should be obvious, but we do appreciate it. The next item is personnel requests, and I think you have some. Yes, uh, I have a couple of things here. Um, number one, I realized after I sent this out, I forgot to tell you who that halftime request was. It's Ingrid Stressinger. It is a continuation of her child care leave. Um, technically, Ingrid is a staff member on full-time contract and uh, last year, and she's asking for a second year um, continuation of that. She teaches one section of kindergarten rather than the two. Kindergarten, this works out rather neatly for us, so I certainly recommend that you grant her request. I have, at this time of year, also received um, notice now from everybody who is out on leave. People coming back, I've received notice from Claire Ruthenberg, Joanne Dow, Deborah Joy Pearson uh, is uh, coming back full-time. Uh, Leslie Knowlton, who is a half-time teacher anyway. She's never worked full-time for us, so her contract is a half-time one. Um, we'll be coming back also. Um, so that is simply the request for the continuation of the half-time leave from Ingrid Strassinger. Um, just before, these are things you can vote on separately or together, but just to finish out uh, these staff changes, uh, I want to take special note that Anita Samuelson, the um, our assistant at the middle school library and Roe Levitt, who has been working at the middle school and guidance special education secretary, has sent me letters of resignation. Um, in their positions, you don't have to vote on them as accepting them the way you do for teachers, but I can't, it's going to be very hard for many of us who, who were here when they first started working to picture the middle school without Anita and Roe. Um, they both happen to be retiring this year, and I wanted to make sure that you knew that, and obviously we'll be thanking them at a later time, but they have given enormous amounts of time over, I think it's at least 20 years. Is it 20? Mm -hmm. And uh, we will certainly miss them. I think Nancy <laughs> will miss them. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's going to be, you, they're the kind of people you don't know how much they do until they're gone. And all of a sudden you realize, gee whiz, who used to do that? <laughs> That's what will happen, I'm sure. Um, also, I have received a letter from Kelly Manahan, um, who has been on child care leave. Um, and she has given us a letter of resignation because she does intend to stay home with the children for an indeterminate amount of time. So her letter is a letter of resignation. Again, we thank Kelly. She is certainly welcome to come back when she's ready to come back when she has, if we have an opening. I mean, what she's doing is um, resigning at this point rather than asking for a continuation of leave, which is appropriate given her, her plans. I 
think that covers my personnel issues at the time. Yes, it does. And I'll leave the nominations for coaching if you want to act on those. I hear a motion. I think we can handle these two together unless there's some objection to that. I just have one question about the halftime kindergarten. How does that play into what the number of sections that will be possibly being proposed right. for next year? Well, that is, there are some uh, issues here that we're, we're not sure of, obviously, but since um, Leslie Knowlton, who is half time and has That's not been full time, she is planning on coming back. So, uh, and um, Deborah Jordan Pearson is asking to go to full time. So, at least as things stand right now, that creates a package, I mean, it gives the two halves for a whole. Now, exactly how many people and who they will be at the kindergarten, I don't know, but I think that that is a, uh, a reasonable step for us to take at this time. Mayor Motion. Could you just tell me what item we're working on? <laughs> the personnel request for the half-time half position for Ingrid Stressinger and the resignation of Kelly Manning. Thank you. Madam Chair, I move that we accept the request for the halftime position of Ingrid Stressinger and accept the resignation of Kelly Manahan. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? It's there. It's been a long day, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, there were some other things thrown in there. Yes, I'm, I'm. <laughs> I, I can do the next one right on time. <laughs> well, I had a lot of, lot of assorted pieces. I'm trying to put them all together. It doesn't always work. And the last piece, the athletic positions, nominations for coaching positions. Um, seventh and eighth grade girls B basketball team, Joe Dome. Seventh and eighth grade girls swimming, Kristen Eames. And seventh and eighth grade boys swimming, Lexi Livingston. I, th I think we need a clarification on the 7th and 8th grade girls B basketball team. I don't think it is a 7th and 8th grade team. I think it's, can you, I don't think there were enough girls that even came out for 8th grade. You know, all the things I could have checked today, I didn't double check that. I, I think you're right, Charlie. I think it's mostly 7th grade students, but it's our, oftentimes our B basketball or our B teams are combinations. And I know, I believe what they're doing is that if they have a game and the other kids, there's enough kids to play one team, some of them may come over and play on the B team for that particular game so that everybody gets an opportunity to play. But I do believe that mostly it is seventh grade students. Yeah. Because I believe our 43 team is struggling this year. I mean, really struggling. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they had a game last night with Wyndham, and they lost 50 to two. I mean, that's, that's and we're not there to win, but I mean, we need. I, I hate to see creating another team when when you have a team that may be struggling because you don't have enough players. Right, and I, I think that mostly you see that the B team is mostly seventh grade. Our seventh grade record is far different than our eighth yeah. grade drastically different than our eighth grade record. And I think you would, that probably the B team is mostly seventh grade students. Well, I, I just want to say that my heart always goes after kids and things like that. And I mean, that's an opportunity to learn, you know, a little character or something, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I, I, believe me, I, I can identify with that. That's the kind of athlete I've always been. There, there have been a, there's a, there are a couple of little struggling things here this year, too, working with a new young coach. and uh, we've, I've managed to work those out with Nancy, and she's worked them out with the coach. So it's, a, it's, it's a struggling year for them. To, to give yeah. the impression that, the, you know, that they're going to get help here, they are. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they'll go out for the B team. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I understand that these three uh, nominations are from um, middle school, but uh, don't we have any high school nominations? I only have what Keith has sent me. We'll have them this next month. Next month? Okay. Okay. Um, then I'll make a motion for it. I move that we accept the athletic positions for the 1993-94 school year as read under 
Item 8C. I second that. Any discussion? All in favor? Sarah? Thank you. Okay, moving right along. It's uh, only 10 of 9. It's doing well lately. I would entertain a motion to enter executive session for the purpose of discussing negotiation. So moved. So second. Any discussion? All in favor? Trading the Dow Jones Industrial Average up just about a point and two thirds to empty out the lunch building so they can do all of that renovation at that point, um, moving faster. Because the more we can leave chunks of the building empty, uh, the faster the work will go. Um, obviously, there'd be some moving around uh, after that. And um, an important issue we're going to have to pin down pretty quickly is where are we going to put the portables. Um, we had some conversation today about traffic patterns and construction patterns and, and safety issues and so on. And, um, We'll be giving you an update on that. Uh, will people know at the end of this year where the, all their children will be in classes next year, or is there a possibility that we won't know? I would anticipate that we can be quite definite on that by June, and maybe by May, or I wouldn't think too much before that, but we already have a tentative schedule. I mean, we've been looking at and figuring out how many rooms we need given the number of divisions we have for next year. So that's, um, we have had some conversation with the portable rental units. Uh, we're asking the clerk of the works to help us in determining exactly where to put them. I mean, there's a whole bunch of technical issues that we have to get into. Uh, I certainly think we can have all of that to people before the end of this school year. I think one of the qualities that came out of this interview was the, safety, the, the attitude of safety in this particular superintendent of, of, of the project if, if he is hired. It's, it's an utmost on his, on his list. Even though it's not part of his job, it's, it's utmost on his priority list. And uh, I think he'll work very closely with, with the school in maintaining. The problem is this is going to be a very highly visible project. We haven't had anything of this magnitude in this town for many, many years, and it's how how do you how do you protect them and safeguard you know when when the construction crews aren't there and that kind of thing. So he's aware that this is going to be a very highly visible project, not just from the standpoint of staff and, and students, but from the community at large. So. And being as close to election, I mean for passage of this referendum that's going to stimulate even more interest. Mm -hmm. Comments? I just want to also point out that uh, I know that uh, Beth and Nancy have been talking to the staff at Pond Cove and that there's been a kind of nice spirit of, of, of um, a sense of pioneer spirit, I guess is the word for it. Uh, we all know that there's a year for the Pond Cove and then the following year, a year for middle school, when um, the, it will be a juggling act to make sure that things are going well educationally. People who will have the least trouble with it will be the students. Uh, they will do just fine, and uh, I think as soon as the staff gets into the group, they'll do just fine too. And we'll certainly try to invite parents, 
so that they can see and allay some of their concerns. And we're trying to think of as many of the predictable questions and concerns that people have. Like I mentioned, uh, the portable air control, we know that that has been raised as an issue, and we want to make sure that we, I can tell you, we will check that, and we will not put anybody in an area that's unsafe. Probably be better air control in some of the places we're using right now. Absolutely. Any other comments, questions? Okay, moving on. Uh, the next item is second reading of the policy on volunteers. And as I said in the packet, and we basically, as I understood it, the major issues that um, people had some problems with, with the repetitive use of the word paid, we simply took it out because, after all, staff does imply, uh, if not actually say, that that is a, an appointed position. So if you're satisfied with that, that was fine with us, too. Uh, Madam Chair, I move we accept. Uh, policy file IICC volunteers as amended to delete the word paid. Thanks. Second that. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? That's zero. Okay, the next item is consideration of recommendation from the principal search committee, and I just know that that's our, Peter was our chair of that committee as well. Well, I don't mind speaking. <laughs> I didn't think you did. <laughs> I want to thank the members of, of the Principal Search Committee, Peter Leslie, Mark Forey, Gail Adsett, Betsy Wiley, Sam Boothby, Ann Kerner. And last year we did have a student representative. Um, I think that this group uh, spent a lot of time last year um, trying to set up criteria, trying to decide uh, how we would go about the interview process, talking to a lot of people, doing a lot of, of referencing and so on. And uh, we all felt, as a result of that process, we had a pretty clear sense of what it was that we were looking for for the building. Um, when we realized that we were, we were looking for an interim principal and turned to our assistant principal, um, Rick DeFusco, it was with a sense that he knew well what that committee had identified as the criteria for the principal, and we frankly thought he, he met those criteria, but we did agree that this would be an interim year. And as a kind of follow-up procedure, we did in fact um, post in-house and attracted a candidate in Randy Ray as the assistant principal. Uh, when the committee got together and, and talked this year over, compared notes, the teachers, in fact, had talked with the faculty, uh, our parent representative had talked with other parents, I also, of course, with the board, we had had that experience too. Um, and frankly, it, it didn't take us very long to come out with a unanimous recommendation from that committee to this school board that um, I nominate Rick DeFusco to be our principal of Elizabeth High School and to nominate Randy Ray to be our assistant principal of Cape Elizabeth High School on a regular basis. And we can scratch the interim. It was with a great deal of pleasure that we came to that decision. It was, I've been in a position to make a lot of personnel decisions and some of them are frankly not that easy to make because you have a little reservation here and there, but this was a relatively easy decision. Can we move, remove interim from channel three effective tomorrow? We certainly can try. We'll try. I'm <laughs> not sure uh, whoever is responsible for doing that. How about your letterhead? What does your letterhead say? There's nothing on it. There's nothing on it. <laughs> <laughs> they have in-house service, though. It's pretty fast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any comments, Charlie? I would only, I only have one um, reservation, not about accepting your nomination, but I would as far as the contract and this year, because the contract states that there is an interim position for this fiscal year. So it, I would recommend it to be for the fiscal year 94, 95. That would be my understanding because the contract has been signed. The, the two reasons for bringing it as a year-long contract. There are two reasons for bringing it at this point. 
uh, as you can see later in the agenda, uh, the whole administrative slate is on here because that is the way the statute now reads, that there should be, uh, it is now becoming regular business in the February. Uh, however, it's always understood that that is an appointment for the following calendar, or excuse me, school year. In our case, it's a fiscal year, July, it starts in July. That is your understanding. <laughs> we had necessarily thought that. Yes, I will see. Okay, I'd like to make a motion. Okay, would you like to deal with the... Why don't we do this one? Yes, separately. I move that we accept the superintendent's nomination. Uh, for, Mr. for Mr. Rick Fusco and Mr. Randy Ray as principal and vice principal of Cape Elizabeth High School. I second that. Any discussion? I would just like to add my uh, input, and that is last year I remember being very much impressed as we did our interviews of the high school principals with the caliber of the staff here at Cape Elizabeth. And at the time that we elected to have an interim principal and vice principal, we all felt very comfortable with the quality of the staff that were fulfilling those positions. Uh, it has been a, really a tremendous joy to watch the success that, that uh, Rick and Randy have had this year, and we very much look forward to uh, the upcoming years with you leading the high school. I certainly agree with what Mark just said. I think many of us at the last board meeting expressed our, our pleasure in working with you. It's, it's been a real pleasure, and I know it's been a pleasure for the children, the students, and the uh, parents. I shouldn't call them. No, no you're good. <laughs> You'll get phone calls tomorrow. Oh, probably. I, I would also um, add my um, con con uh, recommendation to that also. And I think what has happened this year is that Rick has had to had to deal publicly as the principal was a very difficult issue. I think as a system principal in the past, he's been dealing with these, and, and because he was not the front person, had, did not really have to take a lot of heat, and I think he's handled that very well, and I commend him for that. Well, I might as well add my kudos to the uh, administrative team, and I hope ditto isn't flip, but. <laughs> Congratulations. I'm very relieved because I was always afraid at the last minute you might, you know, something might happen today and you <laughs> change your mind. Good. Well, we're looking forward to what's ahead. The next, the next item is new business, nomination of administrators for 1994-95 school year. And as I explained, uh, in case anybody in the public is watching this, there is a change in the state statute. We used to nominate our principals closer to the end of the school year, but it is now um, the policy to do this in February again, as I just said, really for the upcoming year. And, where's my sheets? Uh, since we've already taken care of the first two, I'll start with the rest of the slate. Nancy Hutton, middle school principal. Bill Jewett, middle school assistant principal. Beth Anderson, Pon Cove principal. Nancy St. John, Pon Cove assistant principal. Keith Weatherby, athletic director. I should note that is a half-time position. He is half-time teacher. And Wayne Doerr, director of special education. Uh, those are our building administrators. And we also uh, have a practice of um, uh, appointing the community services director and assistant director, Sue Weatherby and Janet Hoskin. I move that we accept the superintendent's nomination for administrators for the 94-95 school year. Rosemary, any discussion? All in favor? And as I noted in my, uh, my notes to you, this is a hardworking crew. Uh, they deserve, I think, a lot of credit, and I just want to publicly go on record. I've never seen a harder working group. Uh, it's incredible to me. Some days it's hard to think of a cheerful thing to say, and we still manage to smile. 
Um, there is a lot of under, you know, things that don't come to the surface that administrators have to deal with day in and day out. A lot of it is less than glamorous. And the fact that people keep, you know, at it with courage and good humor and always, always caring for kids um, is impressive to me. And really personally, The, the elementary and middle school administrators and staff, it's also, it's also going to impact the high school because there will be students moving, classes moving into those, uh, into that facility also. So it's going to be a, a team effort and, and I see that as we've gone through the concept stage and now into actual phase development, that it's been a cohesive group of folks and that's very positive. It's going to serve as well. Well, we've already had a little conversation at the high school on that and, and uh, discovered that there's going to be, it's a systemic approach, right? <laughs> okay. uh, I, I would just like to say thank you too as board chair for making my job easier and always being willing to talk to me about whatever is on my mind and what's on the mind of board members and being so willing to listen to gripes and give us explanations for things that probably seem like they should be obvious, but we do appreciate it. The next item is personnel requests, and I think you have some. Yes, uh, I have a couple of things here. Um, number one, I realized after I sent this out, I forgot to tell you who that halftime request was. It's Ingrid Stressinger. It is a continuation of her child care leave. Um, technically, Ingrid is a staff member on full-time contract and uh, last year, and she's asking for a second year um, continuation of that. She teaches one section of kindergarten rather than the two. Kindergarten, this works out rather neatly for us, so I certainly recommend that you grant her request. I have, at this time of year, also received um, notice now from everybody who is out on leave. People coming back, I've received notice from Claire Ruthenberg, Joanne Dow, Deborah Jordan Pearson uh, is uh, coming back full-time. Uh, Leslie Knowlton, who is a half-time teacher anyway. She's never worked full-time for us, so her contract is a half-time one. Um, we'll be coming back also. Um, so that is simply the request for the continuation of the half-time leave from Ingrid Strassinger. Um, just before, these are things you can vote on separately or together, but just to finish out uh, these staff changes, uh, I want to take special note that Anita Samuelson, the um, our assistant at the middle school library, and Roe Levitt, who has been working at the middle school and guidance special education secretary, has sent me letters of resignation. Um, in their positions, you don't have to vote on them as accepting them the way you do for teachers, but I can't, it's going to be very hard for many of us who, who were here when they first started working to picture the middle school without Anita and Roe. Um, they both happen to be retiring this year, and I wanted to make sure that you knew that, and. Obviously, we'll be thanking them at a later time, but they have given enormous amounts of time over, I think it's at least 20 years. Is it 20? Mm -hmm. And uh, we will certainly miss them. I think Nancy will miss them. I mean, you know, it's going to be, you, they're the kind of people you don't know how much they do until they're gone, and all of a sudden you realize, gee whiz, who used to do that? <laughs> <laughs> That's what will happen, I'm sure. Um, also, I have received a letter from Kelly Manahan, um, who has been on child care leave, um, and she has given us a letter of resignation because she does intend to stay home with the children for an indeterminate amount of time. So her letter is a letter of resignation. Again, we thank Kelly. She is certainly welcome to come back when she's ready to come back, when she has if we have an opening, I mean, what she's doing is um, resigning at this point rather than asking for a continuation of leave, which is appropriate given her, her plans. I think that covers my personnel issues at the time. Yes, it does, and I'll leave the nominations for coaching if you want to act on those. I hear a motion. I think we can handle these two together. I just have one question about the half time. 
kindergarten, how does that play into what, the number of sections that will be possibly being proposed right. for next year? Well, that is, there are some uh, issues here that we're, we're not sure of, obviously, but since um, Leslie Knowlton, who is half time and has not been full time, she is planning on coming back. So, uh, and um, Deborah Jordan Pearson is asking to go to full time. So, at least as things stand right now, that creates a package, I mean, it gives the two halves for a whole. Now, exactly how many people and who they will be at the kindergarten, I don't know, but I think that that is a, a reasonable step for us to take at this time. Could you just tell me what item we're working on? <laughs> the personnel request for the half-time half position for Ingrid Strassinger and the resignation of Kelly Manahan. Thank you. Madam Chair, I move that we accept the request for the half-time position of Ingrid Stressinger and accept the resignation of Kelly Manahan. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? There. It's been a long day. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, there were some other things thrown in there. So. Yes, I'm. I'm <laughs> I, I can do the next one. Right on. <laughs> well, I had a lot of lot of assorted pieces. I'm trying to put them all together. It doesn't always work. And the last piece, the athletic positions, nominations for coaching positions. Um, seventh and eighth grade girls B basketball team, Joe Dome. 7th and 8th grade girls swimming, Kristen Eames, and 7th and 8th grade boys swimming, Lexi Livingston. I, th I think we need a clarification on the 7th and 8th grade girls B basketball team. I don't think it is a 7th and 8th grade team. I think it's, can you explain? I don't think there were enough girls that even came out for 8th grade. Yeah, all the things I could have checked today, I didn't double check that. I, I think you're right, Charlie. I think it's mostly seventh grade students, but it's our oftentimes our B basketball or our B teams are combinations. And I know I believe what they're doing is that if they have a game and the other kids there's enough kids to play one team, some of them may come over and play on the B team for that particular game so that everybody gets an opportunity to play. But I do believe that mostly it is seventh grade students. Because I believe our 483 team is struggling this year. I mean, really struggling. <laughs> I mean, they had a game last night with Wyndham, and they lost 50 to 2. I mean, that's, that's, that's struggling. And look, we're not there to win, but I mean, we need, I, don't, I hate to see creating another team when, when you have a team that may be struggling because you don't have enough play. Right, and I, I think that mostly you see that the B team is mostly seventh grade. Our seventh grade record is far different than our eighth yes. grade, drastically different than our eighth grade record. And I think you would, that probably the B team is mostly seventh grade students. Well, I, I just want to say that my heart always goes after kids and things like that. And I mean, that's an opportunity to learn, you know, a little character or something, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I, I Believe me, I, I can identify with that. That's the kind of athlete I've always been. <laughs> there, there, have been a, there's some, there are a couple of little struggling things here this year, too, working with a new young coach. And uh, we've, I've managed to work those out with Nancy, and she's worked them out with the coach. So it's a, it's, it's a struggling year for them. <laughs> to, to give yeah. the impression that, the, you know, that they're going to get help here, they aren't. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they'll go out for the B team. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I understand that these three uh, nominations are for um, middle school, but uh, don't we have any high school nominations? I only have what Keith has sent me. We'll have them approved next month. Next month? Okay. All of them Okay. Um, then I'll make a motion for it. I move that we accept the athletic positions for the 1993-94 school year as read under Item eight C. I second that. Any discussion? All in favor? Zero. Thank you. Okay, moving right along. 